Well, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors here at Stillwater, and I'm so thankful that you came out this morning to worship Jesus here with us uh, this weekend. It's great to see you all. Uh, We've been talking about what it means to move forward through various challenging times in life. And this morning we're talking about what it means to move forward through times of failure. Now, if uh, many times we look at successful people and we say, how is it that that person has been so successful and yet I've struggled, right? We, we all probably have those in life. And, and we oftentimes look at folks who've been successful and we assume they haven't really failed much. I mean, because look at where they're at. But that's rarely is that true. In fact, oftentimes the most successful people are those who have failed over and over and over again, and yet they've used that failure as a catalyst to drive them forward towards excellence. We've got a video here of a basketball player who knew all about failure. Check this out. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And that is why he's still better than LeBron, even if they do win again this year, let me tell you. I know, that's a controversial topic nowadays, isn't it? I'm, I'm from Illinois, so I'll always be loyal to Jordan, but you've got to give it to LeBron and the Cavs. They're pretty impressive, aren't they? Well, you know, Michael Jordan, we remember him for his incredible successes, six championships, all these incredible things that he did. And yet, time after time after time, he missed shots. He, uh, 26 times, right? The ball was in his hands, and the Bulls lost at the end of the game. I mean, that's a big deal. That's a big deal, but, but today, we don't remember him for those things. No, we remember all the shots he made. We remember the championships. We don't remember all those seasons that he lost, which was the majority of the seasons he played. We remember the six that he won. Because why? He was willing to push forward through all those failures, all those struggles. He, Jordan was successful because he's one of the most competitive players ever to play the game. And he was continually driven towards excellence by his own struggles and and by what other people thought of him. He would look at other people who would criticize him, and and he would internalize it so much that he'd become a harder and harder worker, and and he'd practice more, and he'd work more, and he got better and better. And you know, failure can do the same type of thing in our lives. You failed, I failed, you've done it in the past, I'll do it in the future. It's part of being a human. But God can use our failures to bring, it, bring about great things in our lives. Now, God doesn't cause us to fail. Okay? That's kind of our own doing. We don't really need divine intervention to fail, right? We're, we're perfectly good at that on our own strength. But God uses our failures. He doesn't let those things go to waste. As the great recycler, God is able to take those failures and use them to bring about good things in our lives if we're willing to let him do so. Failure can be a catalyst to help us to become more like Jesus. I was reading a psychologist named Albert Ellis, and he was talking about uh, the components of the ways that we process various things in life. And one of the keys to to overcoming failure is the way that we tend to process it. How do we look at failure? Because we could process it as something saying, hey, I don't want to try that again. I failed, so I'm not going to go there again. I'm going to just, you know, I'm not good at that. I quit, you know. Or we could process it differently. He he kind of gives three components of the way that we process things. Uh, There they follow kind of an ABC logic. The first one, antecedents. That's a big word, I know. It's in your notes. You may have to look on the, on the screen to spell it right. Don't, don't worry if you do. I use spell check, okay? Uh, so uh, it's a hard one to spell. But antecedents, it's kind of a uh, basically means the stuff that happens in life. But since stuff that happens with, in life doesn't start with A, well, we have antecedents instead, okay? So the stuff that happens to us, um, you know, these, this is just your experience. It's what you've been through. And we oftentimes assume that the antecedents, the things that happen, are what leads to the results, or C, the consequences. 
say, so, so this thing happened, A for antecedents, and then that leads to C, the consequences, the, the results. So let's say that you're raised in a home with parents who oftentimes made bad decisions. And so you say, you know, I, I, what, my parents, they struggled, they made a lot of bad decisions. So the consequence is that I too make bad decisions today because I don't know any better, I wasn't raised better. If I would have had a better set of parents who were smarter or made better choices, then maybe I could make better choices. That's a pretty dismal way of looking at life, isn't it? Because if that's the case, what hope do we really have? You, you basically have the deck of cards that, that you were dealt, or the hand of cards you were dealt, and sorry about your luck. Uh, there's your antecedents, and they're going to lead to certain consequences. But the thing is, it's not true. Because we're missing a key letter, thank God. We're missing B, and B stands for our beliefs. Your antecedents, when filtered through your beliefs, lead to the consequences. And your beliefs, you can control. You can't control the antecedents. You can't control everything given to you. But you can certainly control your beliefs about those things. The way that you handle them. The way that you process them. That is fully in your control. Nobody can make you believe anything. Nobody can make you feel anything. These are choices that you and I take, have. We have full control over these things. And so, as we look at this, we see this truth in, in many different ways. Let me illustrate the story of a guy named uh, John Ortberg. He's a pastor um, now in Southern California, a pastor and an author. And John was writing about a time where he and his wife Nancy went out for ice cream. And so there, Southern California, they're standing at an ice cream stand in line, and, and um, his wife elbows him, and she says, don't look, but Tom Cruise just stepped behind us. So of course, <laughs> there he is, Tom Cruise in the flesh, right there behind them, just got there to get ice cream, right? So, so, so John turns around, he sees Tom Cruise, and he is surprised, his beliefs are interesting. He's actually surprised because you may or may not know this, but Tom Cruise is about five foot seven, right? He's not a very tall guy. In fact, here he is compared to a number of women that you've seen him with, shorter than all of them, right? And, and, and John was surprised by this because, of course, in movies they use all sorts of tricks, right? They have you stand on blocks or they use different lighting or different angles, whatever, to make sure that he appears the way they want him to appear. And so John goes to whisper to his wife and say, He's kind of short. And he gets a big elbow from her, and she says, he can hear pretty well too. You shouldn't be talking about him. It's Tom Cruise, right? We don't want to hurt his feelings or upset him. And so, so his beliefs about Tom is that he's, he's fairly unimpressed. I mean, here's this guy who's so much larger than life on the screen, and yet here, he just seems like a, one of the rest of us, right? Just a normal old person. His wife's beliefs about Tom Cruise, however, different. She saw Tom in a very different light, perhaps a light more like this. I love you. You? Just, just shut up. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. Oh, isn't that just sweet? So he sees Tom Cruise and says, huh, not all that impressive. And she's like, Tom, you had me at hello. <laughs> and their views are so different, right? Now, the antecedent's the same. Tom Cruise standing next to him in, in an ice, at an ice cream stand. But beliefs about Tom Cruise, very, very different. So they order their ice cream. They, they step outside, and uh, John's standing there. He's eating his ice cream. Nancy looks down. She doesn't have her ice cream, and she realizes she must have left it at the counter, right? So she goes back in, and she says to the, to the person at the ice cream stand, excuse me, I think you forgot to give me my ice cream. And Tom Cruise steps forward, and he says, lady, you put it in your purse. <laughs> Same antecedents. 
Different consequences, right? Our beliefs about Tom Cruise impacted our actions. She's so starstruck, she just gets the ice cream with Tom Cruise, <laughs> walks right on out. See, this is why two people can experience very similar antecedents and come out with very different consequences. Like, we see this in siblings all the time. You're raised by the same parents in a fairly similar situation, and yet you go on to make very different life choices. Why? Those beliefs... Those beliefs, those things you can control. Or you'll see people in a job. They'll have the same manager, very similar circumstances, very similar challenges. One will rise to the occasion, one will not. Why? It's those beliefs. And guess what? You get to control those. You do. Nobody can control those for you. And I'm not arguing that your antecedents may be rough. They may be really tough. But, but friends, by the power of God, we have the ability to overcome our failures. We do. It's not just because you're better or smarter than anybody else. It's because you have the power of God inside of you. As a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and that should shape your beliefs. That should impact your views of your failures. That should cause you to have a hope that is so much greater than you would have if you didn't know Jesus. We see many examples of this in Scripture. In this series, we've been talking about the Apostle Paul. Paul certainly overca overcame a lot of challenges in his life. We talked last week about how he was shipwrecked, how he was arrested, how he was beaten time and time again. Uh, they threw rocks at him and left him for dead. I mean, many things that this guy went through that could have easily been seen as failures. Paul was often not well received. His message was often rejected. And yet he didn't quit. He didn't quit. He kept on going. He kept on going. Uh, one place uh, here in Philippians, he's kind of he's looking back at some of these things, and and he's at this time. Remember, he's in chains. He's on his way to Rome to be to be tried ultimately uh, for for disrupting their society for proclaiming Jesus as he does. And, and he says this in verse twelve. Uh, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has been, become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. So here he is, he's arrested, he's on his way to trial, and now we know ultimate execution. And yet he says, this is all to advance the sake of Christ. The, the guards around me, they know this now. Why? Because he had taken this opportunity, this failure, if you will, and he'd used it for good. He's got a uh, captive audience of guards right there with him who he shares with about Jesus. We know time and time again, people who were even holding Paul, they were ones who would become followers of Jesus. He didn't waste a single opportunity. Even the antecedents that would seem terrible to us, he used those, by God's grace, to bring about good. While he was, while he was in prison, there were plenty of, plenty of problems happening out there. In fact, uh, some other people had started to, uh, to preach about Jesus, but they were doing it for kind of their own selfish motives. And, and Paul addresses that, um, verse 18, addresses this and a bunch of other problems by saying this, but what does it matter? Really, <laughs> so what? So what? Yeah, these are antecedents. Some of them are problems. But so what? Because I've got the risen Christ. And that kind of trumps everything else. That trumps all these problems. That trumps all these bad situations. That trumps all these failures. The risen Christ lives in me. So what? <laughs> everything else. And that changes our view of life, doesn't it? Our beliefs, which we control, can change our view of life. Paul was on a mission to reach Rome with the gospel, and the, he needed access. How do you get access to the higher people in Rome? Well, he was going to get it in the form of a trial. And so he sees this as a phenomenal opportunity. Paul believed that all this stuff, it's not an accident, but yet that God is using this to advance the, his kingdom. God is using this to advance the gospel. In fact, later Paul would say this in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. <laughs> it's pretty hard to defeat somebody with that attitude, right? <laughs> I'm here living and, and that's great, right? I can live for Jesus Christ. 
but ultimately, if you kill me, right, take it all away and kill me, well, that's gain, because I get to go to heaven, I get to be with Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. He's not suicidal here. Paul clearly wants to keep on living. He wants to keep on sharing the good news. But he says, hey, ultimately, living is for Christ, and dying, well, <laughs> I'm going to be with Jesus. So, so that's a win, too. You can't defeat a guy like that. You, you truly can't. Life is tough. So what? I mean, really, you and me, we have difficult lives. We do. You've got probably plenty of antecedents, plenty of them that I don't know or understand. But what I do know and understand is the God who lives inside of you. The God whose hope that we, we, we have our hope in Him. Not in ourselves. As we look at our own failures, our own challenges, our own struggles, let's not get so wrapped up in that as we get wrapped up in the God who wants to help us through. We rejoice. We celebrate God's work in our, in our lives. And you know, friends, when we forget this truth, when we forget how God can use our beliefs to shape us and bring about very different situations, when we forget that, it's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Because instead, we can be just driven by our own failures, our own letdowns, the failures of others, and we fail to see the great hope and potential that we have in Jesus Christ. This, this past week on uh, Thursday, a friend of mine was, was laid to rest. His name is Seth Euler. Some of you know Seth. Um, Seth, uh, he, Seth actually, uh, I met him when I served in Piqua. Uh, when, when I was there, uh, I got to be one of his pastors. And Seth responded to God's call in his life uh, to be a pastor. And so Seth, at that time, uh, he, he was just kind of early on in that call, sorting that out to figure out what it all means. Uh, Seth would eventually start coming here to Stillwater. He sang on our praise team for a time. Um, in fact, the week before my first Sunday here, Seth actually preached here at Stillwater. And so Seth's somebody uh, who uh, we, I had connection in the past and Stillwater's had connections with. And... Um, Seth's life ended very tragically a week ago Thursday um, when, when Seth, unfortunately, he took his own life. And you know, for Seth, he was a man with phenomenal potential. I mean, he had, uh, in our, our system, uh, he had been appointed to a local church, Ware's Chapel, by Pastor Duane, uh, my predecessor, who was our district superintendent. He was sent to Ware's Chapel. He bro brought about great growth there, lots of good things. He was then uh, selected to be a resident, which is like a special training program that we have. Went to Columbus for that. Was appointed to another church there in the greater Columbus area. And God was using Seth to do a lot of really, really good things. Unfortunately, Seth had a failure in his life. Unfortunately, he had an affair with someone who was there on the church staff. Very wrong thing, a very tragic thing. And Seth was asked to step away from ministry, appropriately so, and, and he did. But for Seth, the beliefs that he had took a back seat to, to the failure that he experienced in his life. And that led him to make a very horrible one-time decision. Unfortunately, that one-time decision is a permanent ending to very temporary problems. And you know, Seth's death makes me sad, and it makes me angry as well. Because of all people, we as pastors, we have access to grace. <laughs> we proclaim it every weekend. We know that there is hope after failure. There's hope in the midst of problems. And, and I grieve today for, for Seth. We pray for his family, for Joyce, and for the kids because there's so much more to life than just your failures, friends. Don't let failure drive your decisions. Imagine if Michael Jordan, right, when he started missing shots, imagine if he quit then. Imagine if you would have quit through your earlier failures in life. The, the loss would be phenomenal. You see, God works through failure. God works through failure. And you know, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. 
I strongly believe that. The Bible says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things in the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I believe that today Seth is in the loving arms of the God who made him. Yes, yeah, Seth made a mistake. He certainly did. But nothing can separate us from that love. Even our own failures. Quite frankly, I don't care how badly you've messed things up. Because I believe in a God who's bigger than even your worst mistakes. Even my worst mistakes. He's bigger than that. And yeah, I understand that they matter and I understand you're disappointed and I understand that you, you've probably hurt yourself and others, but we serve a God who's in the redemption business. He raises people from the dead, remember? And a God who can raise people from the dead is certainly bigger than my failures and your failures. No matter what you've done, it's redeemable by the grace of God. There is hope, there is forgiveness, There is new life in Jesus Christ. You can move forward through failure because you have the power of the resurrected Christ in you. You're going to fail again someday. Hopefully it's not major, but you'll have things, I'm sure. I'll have things, I'm sure. And yet the power of the resurrected Christ is what's going to take us forward. As we we look at our world, we see so many examples of people who, who live out this truth. In fact, uh, we, we sit here today and we get to enjoy uh, the work of a guy named Thomas Edison, right? Because we have lights on in here, right? Edison invented the light bulb. Anybody know how many times he failed before he invented it? 10,000. Can you imagine failing 10,000 times? Now, what does Edison say about that? I, I, love, I love his response. He goes, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. What a great approach. That's probably the only approach that you can have to fail 10,000 times and yet keep on going. I mean, imagine if he would have quit after failure number 10 or 100 or 5,059. What if he would have quit? What if tragically he gets to the number 9,999 and says, you know what? I'm not good at making light bulbs. I quit. I would bet, I don't know this, but I would bet that there were other inventors, probably equally or more smart than him, probably had the access to the same things that he had access to, and yet they didn't invent the light bulb. Why? Because they quit too soon. They gave up. Not many people have the tenacity to go 10,000 ways that don't work and then find the right one. But boy, I'm thankful that he did. December 1776 was a very rough time for General George Washington. He was leading uh, the, the Continental Army, and they had been defeated by the British time after time. In the Revolutionary War, they're fighting for the, the freedom that we now enjoy. Washington's army was depleted. They were defeated. They had been, uh, they had been uh, continually pushed back. They were, they were on Long Island, and they got pushed back to Manhattan. They retreated from there to New Jersey. They got pushed out of there, back, retreated back into Pennsylvania. The British continued to take more and more territory. Their army got more and more injured, more and more small, and more and more demoralized. Washington's armies didn't have the supplies they need. In fact, a, a number of his men didn't even have shoes. And it's the middle of winter. Even more so, in less than a month... Uh, many of the contracts that, that Washington's army had with the militias would expire, and so they would be free to go home. So his army was soon to be depleted even more. It seemed like a truly hopeless situation. But on Christmas night, December of 1776, Washington made a courageous and perhaps crazy decision. He, put, he, he told his men that they were going to go out and they were going to cross the Delaware River, and they were going on the offensive. They had been playing defense all this time, and instead they were going to make a move and they were going to attack. So at that Christmas night, 
in the midst of a terrible winter storm of, of snow and sleet that were mixed, they got in the boats, and here they crossed the icy Delaware River. Uh, they, they, they battled through the ice, they battled through freezing temperatures, through, through difficult winds. Some of them, again, marched in with no shoes, and they attacked, and they won. This battle did not win them the war, but it would be seen as the turning point in the war. It would be the first of numerous victories that would lead to the ultimate victory of defeating the British and helping the United States of America to become a country. Aren't you glad that Washington didn't quit? He had a lot of reasons to quit. Plenty of reasons to say, you know what, it's, we've tried, but, but we've failed too many times. I, I'm done. I'm done. We, we'll just be colonies, right? We'll just be colonies of Britain, and that's just how it's going to be. But he didn't quit, and neither should you. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what your challenges, you have the power of the risen Christ living within you. So go forgive again. Go apply for another job. Go back to the doctor. Take the medicine. Go, go reach out to that person that you have distance between. Go try that thing you haven't been able to succeed in. Get up. Because God, the risen, the risen Christ, lives inside of you. And God can work through even your most difficult challenges. Even through your most difficult times of failure. God, thank you that you never give up on us. We tend to give up. We lose heart because we know how limited we are. But God, would you help us to see how unlimited that you are? <laughs> we know our limits, but help us not to focus on those, but instead to focus on the unlimited power that you have. God, would you help us to know your will, to seek your will, to follow your will for our lives? Lord, would you use our times of failure to be times that inspire us and empower us to take the next right step? whether that means that we need to get back up and try again, or that means we need to adjust our course and try something different. God, help us to never quit, to never give up. Thank you for never quitting on us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you, and we pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.